Hello, welcome to Trash Arts Tick Season 2, Episode 6, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Right. Um, so please, guys, leave us a like, leave us a comment if um, there's anything that you thought was really good within the podcast, and um, please subscribe. So today, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. Uh, I know we missed it last week, so we're going to get right into that. Then we're going to be, well, Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing Raka Fett Abigail, who is a, an esteemed filmmaker in America. Uh, so Sam had the pleasure of uh, speaking to her. And then we're going to be discussing our favourite horror films. So other, without further ado, over to you, Sam. So with the continuing year that is 2020, films have been pushed to 2021. June is no longer coming out at Christmas. That's now moved to October 2021. Bond has moved to April 2021. Soul, which I think last time I talked about this, I said, oh, they're not going to move that. Well, that's coming out on Disney Plus for Christmas. So it's, everything's moved around. Lots of DC films are in a bit of a problematic place. And yeah, the schedule's a mess. But, you know, if you're going to schedule films three years in advance, you should expect the world to still be moving and not just that that, that particular industry is going to stay, you know, as it were. But I suppose it's all unpredicted but crazy nonetheless. I suppose that's just off the backlash of Tenant as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, now Tenant's being considered as a really bad thing for cinema, that it was supposed to be the hope for the cinemas, and if anything, it kind of led to the downfall of the cinema, as well as, of course, COVID. But, yeah, it's, it's not great. But again, the films will be released, and if anything, we're just looking at some very stacked, carnivorous, blood-soaked box office fights next year. <laughs> So we'll see, we'll see. Reed Morano, who uh, was one of the creators of The Handmaid's Tale, um, is to direct a film called Memory Police, which is described as a haunting Orwellian novel about the terror of state surveillance. This is based on an old Japanese book from about 23 years ago. And Charlie Kaufman is going to write the script for it. Oh, nice. Amazon have bought this as a package. It sounds kind of cool. I mean, Reed Morano, I haven't... Uh, I know her films are... She's done a couple of films, but she's more known for her TV work, and she has done some great TV work. And of course, Kaufman's a genius. But whether this is just him diving in to pay for something, which is never actually a bad thing, because it means he's still trying to work, I guess we'll see. Talking to prolific writers, Aaron Sorkin, he wants to write The Social Media too. He wants to do a sequel to The Social Network. How would that work? Well, basically... Because, you know, Zuckerberg is, the whole Facebook thing's been a, like a little easy gift to the alt-right. He wants to focus on that side of how it became that. But he said he'd only write the script if David Fincher confirmed that he would direct it. Mm. It's the only way he'll do it. He wants to write, he's desperate to write, he's met with the producers, the studio have talked about it. But Fincher's doing Fincher. And in fact, this week, Fincher's trailer for Mank, his uh, film, which has been the first film he's done in six years outside of directing Mindhunter. And it's a very close film. It's a sign that his uh, dad originally wrote the script for it, and it's all about the complicated relationship with Orson Welles and the writer, Mank. And it looks stunning. The trailer's amazing. It's well worth trying. Uh, which, well worth trying? It's well worth checking out. And again, it's from Netflix. It comes out on December the 4th. And finally, the millennial killer's cousin, Kaya Scordelario, you'd probably hate the way I pronounce that, has been cast in the new Resident Evil reboot. Which is, you know, it's, um, it's interesting because the names made all the um, Resident Evil fans very excited from the computer games. Because they used the names we go, oh wow, this is actually going to be based on the first games. The weird thing with the Resident Evil films is they kind of just throw you straight into the laboratory or where the fuck it was. But in the original games, it's on the streets of R Raccoon City and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, that could be cool. It's, uh, the director is um, Johan Roberts, who's done a few horror films. Maybe it'll work. We'll see. Netflix is still doing their own series and randomly releasing an animated film this month, I think. So we'll see. We'll see what works. And finally, in regards back to Trash Arts, we've opened a store on Teesprings. <laughs> if you look up Trash Arts Limited, you can find things that you never thought you needed. Like the truth without socks. <laughs> <laughs> or get yourself a fixer mask before the film's released. Fix yourself a mask. And if you're a fan of our Open Your Mouth event, which is also tomorrow on Monday at 8pm, if you check it out on Facebook, you can get yourself a mask, 
a phone case, or something else that excites you like a fanny pack. <laughs> There'll so. be more to come as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's 8pm UK time. And also, on that note, please follow the Open Your Mouth um, Facebook page. Thanks, Sam, for that. So, Sam had the pleasure of uh, interviewing <coughs> Rakitet Abigail, who is, like I said before, an esteemed American filmmaker. So, over to you, Sam, for that interview. I'm on Trash Arts Talk with Rakefe uh, Abigail. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. I've had a very productive day, so that's always good. Uh, I just woke up, so <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done anything yet. I made tea. <laughs> So what got you interested in um, filmmaking? Um, well, I've always, I've always been an actress since I was really little, and it's always what I wanted to do was like act. Um, and then a few years ago, I decided that I was kind of tired of playing only kind of comedic roles, which is I, I used to do stand up, so I got kind of pigeonholed in the comedy world. Anyway, and so I decided to write my own stuff and write roles that I really wanted to play that I wasn't getting cast in. So <clears throat> I did have a look a bit of your IMDb and you're, <clears throat> you've done a lot of um, extra work or small parts within big productions like She's All That, My Name Is Elle, Super Bad. A, uh, She's All That was extra work, everything else was not extra work. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Those were like actual parts. How does that compare to like the filmmaking that you're used to now, you know, compared to those bigger budgets? working with that before oh, going I mean, into filmmaking. It's completely different, obviously. I mean, I they have, I don't even know how many more times money than I did when I made my films, but um, it's just different. It's different. I mean, you're talking about a studio versus me. Mm. Um, it's a different experience, but I learned a lot from being on those bigger sets because you see how a set should be run in like the large scale and so I try to run my sets similarly because there's a reason it's run there's a reason there's things that happen in a certain order and there's a reason certain people run certain departments and um there's a reason every department is there and of course when you're an independent filmmaker you can't have all the departments and people aren't just doing one job like I did a hundred jobs and so did everybody else um so but if you can kind of emulate the way that they do things on a real set, um, the easier your time is going to be, I think, because there's a, it's just easier. <laughs> so would you say it has definitely been beneficial having that more industry experience when stepping into? Oh filmmaking? yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's been extremely beneficial. I know people, and I've been on sets and I know how they work and whatever but in other ways it, it, maybe it could be a hindrance because I've met a lot of people in the indie world who have very indie mentalities meaning like they're like I'm just going to get it done however I can get it done right because like what else what other choice is there and I feel like I'm missing out on that um skill because I have this idea of like this is how it should be versus um well, what can I do? Like, how can I make this what I want it to be? Or I might say to myself, like, oh, we can't do that because we can't do it right. Mm. And it's like somebody who has an indie mentality might be like, um, even if we don't do it right, we can do it our way and it's going to be awesome. And so I, I'm trying to, like, embrace that indie mentality more because it's a very can-do kind of an attitude, whereas mm. the studio attitude is very much like this prohibits that and this prohibits that and it, it puts you in a box and it it's really hard to like do things that um, you want to get done when you don't have the kind of money to do it that way. Yeah, it's a weird one. It's like when you have less control of the studios and stuff, you, you have more freedom, but you don't have any money for that freedom. So it's like... Right, uh, so I have, I'm like, I can do anything I want and then I'm not answering anybody, but yeah, but the reason I'm not answering anybody is because nobody's giving me their money that I have to answer <laughs> to, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, other than with both of my projects, I crowdfunded. So, of course, our our fans gave and unsupporters gave us money. And I wanted to answer to them as far as, like, giving them a good product. Mm. But they're not going to tell me, like, you know, you have to use a permit here. Or you have to, <laughs> or you can't blow that up. Or you can't, <laughs> you know, like, whatever. Tell us about the first film you I, wrote. So, the first film you wrote, if I'm right, please correct me if I'm wrong, was, it was Jackson Love. Correct, yes. Which I actually... Jackson um, Love. Yeah, that screened, um, I think it was 2019 Horror on Sea. 
it screened before it our film Lonely Hearts. So yeah, I had the pleasure oh, nice. of actually watching it, and it was it was a great little film. Tell us a bit about what it was like making that film from like a performance side, and obviously writing it and being so heavily involved. Um, writing it took me about a year because I honestly didn't know what I was doing per se. I mean, look, I went to film school and I studied screenwriting and all that stuff, but it was like twenty years before. You know what I mean? Like this was a long time ago, and I I never did anything with it, so to speak. So here I am trying to write this short. I wrote it. Um, it took me a long time, and then I had no idea how to how to how to make it. Like I really didn't know like what I needed to do. So I brought on a producer who um, supposedly knew what she was doing, and she didn't so much. And she was also a little bit crazy, but um, <laughs> the, you learn things when you do these things. But at the time, I thought it was a good idea, and I you know I tried to get as many people who kind of did know what they were doing um, around me so that they could kind of show me what to do. Um, and I didn't direct it because I was too nervous because I really had no idea what to do. And so I hired a director, Colin Campbell, who his short was up for an Oscar like nice. 15 years ago. And um, they, he didn't, unfortunately didn't win, but I mean, I could say like, I hired an Oscar nomination <laughs> director, <laughs> so I felt good about that. Um, and, and the shooting was hard. I mean, we were shooting in Palmdale, which is like the desert in the middle of nowhere, California. And it's like 118 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's, um, it's just hot and miserable. And I had a lot of volunteers and people who weren't getting paid, um, what they deserved to be paid because I couldn't. And I was putting people up at a hotel because it was too far to drive back and forth to LA. And, it was just a very expensive, difficult endeavor. There were moments of fun, <laughs> but for the most part, it was like, it was almost like being through film school all over again, but like hands on. Mm -hmm. And which is why, unless you really want to study film, I would say just go try to make a movie. Like don't, <laughs> don't waste your money on expensive film school. Um, but it was, I don't know, it was a crazy experience. I, I was joking to another, inter, like, a podcast the other day that the behind the scenes, if we had had them, of Jackson Love, like, what was going on behind the scenes was way more interesting than the movie and probably <laughs> more violent. <laughs> like, it was just, um, uh, We've all been through those experiences. Always happens. Yeah, it, I, after I finished, I said, I'm never doing this again like I, I swore to people I was like never 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 and then boo happened <laughs> but um, I ate my words I guess before we talk about boo obviously with Jackson Love it got a hell of a lot of festival attention and um, am I right in thinking you won a few awards for writing or nominated oh for uh, writing I got like 10, 10 best actress awards um, we got a, a few script writing awards um, and some like best horror short type of awards. Um, it was look. I submitted to a lot of places, a lot because I had no idea. Um, first of all, I had no idea how many you should submit to or not, and I didn't really ask anybody. And also, I didn't know which ones were like really legitimate festivals versus maybe don't waste your money on these festivals versus this is a great festival, but it wouldn't take your movie because it doesn't fit in with their thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I really knew nothing. So I submitted to a lot of festivals, but we had about a 30% acceptance rate in the end. That's so sad. I felt like that's pretty good mm -hmm. regardless. But because I submitted to so many, that 30% was like a large amount. I think it was like 70 festivals or something crazy um but we got rejected from again 70 percent of what i submitted to but it's also you know it's a 20 minute short which is a very long short um people kept telling me to cut it i even gave it to seth rogan to watch um and he told me to cut it <laughs> he was like you don't need the first 10 minutes and i was like i'm not cutting the first 10 minutes um i was like i'm sure you know what you're talking about <laughs> but um, I was. It was my first movie, and and I did cut the first like three or four minutes that is not in the final cut um, from what he had seen because I really thought this scene doesn't need to be there. Um, 
But other than that, I really wanted to make the movie that I wanted to make, and I didn't listen to the people who were telling me, it has to be 10 minutes, it has to be this, it has to be that. And I was just like, you know what? This is what I wanted to make. I spent a lot of money and time and effort and work and sweat and literal blood and tears, and I just... um, uh, this is what I'm doing and if people don't like it or don't want to program it then so be it and it turned out obviously that people did want to program it and did like it so <laughs> so now I just don't listen to anybody <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of now crazy. I just do whatever the hell I want <laughs> what's well, the thing because like you said your first experience of in film was with working in the industry whereas obviously a hell of a lot of rules and people telling people what to do and with your first right. film it seems like most more in the post-production stage you stuck by your guns, and yeah, you've won multiple awards, and it obviously made you feel a bit more prepared to move on to directing yourself with uh, Boo. Yeah, which I was also not going to do, but I was convinced by some fellow filmmakers I was going to co-direct it with someone, and they were like, stop it. <laughs> like, you can direct it. Like, I mean, look, I didn't direct Jax. Colin directed it, but I was... I'm the producer, I'm the writer, I was starring in it, I was the one who spoke to the actors on set, like, I did a lot of directing Mm -hmm. on set, regardless, and he and Colin was gracious enough to, like, let me, and not be, like, I'm the, you know, he was never, he, he understood this was my baby, and he was there to, like, help facilitate it, and that's how he kind of treated it, um, which was really nice of him, um, because I just wanted to learn. And so with Boo, I was going to do that again. And everyone convinced me, like, stop it. You know what you're doing. You're doing it anyway. Like, you're directing it anyway. Like, stop it. Put your name on it. So um, I still didn't feel super comfortable because I'm starring in it. And I'm in every single shot of the movie. And I was worried um, that it would be just too much to direct it for the first time and et cetera. So actually, my editor, Ned Thorne, he edited Jax and Boo, and he's an amazing editor. He also writes and directs on his own. Um, he, I asked him to kind of be like a, a consulting director on set with me, like someone that I could just refer to if I wasn't sure what to do, or if I got lost, or if I was just like on camera too much and I couldn't be behind the camera, I could trust him to make sure that you know, whatever was happening over, you know, far away from me was, was happening the way that it should be happening, the way I wanted it to be happening. Um, just kind of like a proxy for me, so to speak. Um, and he was amazing and he was so helpful. And, um, so yeah, (laughs) that's how I ended up directing Boo, which was, um, a really cool experience. And now, of course, I won't ever let anybody direct my movies again. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <sighs> I, think, I think you did the right thing, though. I always try to, when I work with first-time filmmakers, if I'm producing something for them or doing something within the film, in my mind, it's always like, you know, you build a team as a creative. It is, it's about teamwork. It's not about that individual. So to have people with those experience, it's only going to make the film better. And I think it's good that you, you, you know, dived into that immediately. Some people... They don't want to do that. They want to focus on all they, of their skills that they don't They have just yet. want to do what they... Yeah, I mean, like, look, even with the crew that we hired on Boo, I learned so much from Jax because Jax was a disaster, as I previously mentioned. I, honestly, I don't know how that movie got made at all. Um, I, I even had, like, a little mini nervous breakdown after the movie because my boyfriend at the time ghosted me and I, like, lost it for, like, three months and, like, went into, like, hibernation and didn't... I wouldn't edit the movie. I didn't do anything. And, like, it almost didn't get made. <laughs> like, it's just kind of amazing. Um, but anyway, but, like, because that was such a disaster, I made sure on Boo that I, like, knew exactly who we were hiring. I went with people I really believed were the best at their jobs, um... There were a few people that I would say maybe were not the best decisions, but overall, I I really we gathered like an amazing crew. My DP Alex Griffin is amazing, and he I don't know he's super talented, but also like maybe the nicest person ever, and the most patient and kind, and in a DP that's awesome. He never got like flustered or anything. Um, and Marshall Langor, who helped me produce it, and he stood in for AD at some points. Like, he he really helped me a lot on set because he runs professional sets as well in the industry, and he knows how to run it, and I wanted it to be run that way. Um, so, 
I don't know. It's pretty. It's it's been a pretty amazing experience, and you have to have people who know better. You know, our gaffer. She's been like a gaffer on like the some of the bi- biggest projects and the only problem we had really with her was she wanted she kept wanting things that I was like I can't give you that <laughs> you know she's like we should have a crane and I'm like I can't give you a crane I don't know what to tell you like I know you're used to like working with like where you can get what you need but I can't get you everything that you need you're just gonna have to take what we have and like figure out how to get get what you need <laughs> um but Yeah, it's really good to get people, but not only, I almost think it's better to get people who maybe are not as experienced, but are easy to work with and you are, and are going to be good on set. Um, Because you can have somebody who knows everything and is really good at their job, but they're a nightmare. (laughs) And, 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 and honestly, it's not worth it. It's not worth the, the knowledge to deal with a nightmare on set when everybody's, you know, at their wits end. We had three overnight shoots, all three of them in a row. Um, so it was like all of a sudden we were all being, you know, we're up all night. And, you know, it was hard. It was hard on everybody. Um, and you got to have people who are not going to, like, lose it <laughs> on set or we're not gonna like just be jerks to everybody and make everybody miserable and it makes the whole set miserable you know if it's if you're not I really tried to focus on like everybody having fun because I was like if we're not having fun we shouldn't be doing this and I wasn't having as much fun on my first project so I wanted it and so this one went off pretty pretty seamlessly we had very few problems and um it was stressful of course but but it was fun and I felt like we had a really nice really nice group of people am I right thinking that Boo comes out on video on demand in the next week or so so it comes out on Alter on October 19th that's our online premiere um and then it's going to be on a video on demand channel I think this month but I haven't gotten confirmation yet and I'm not allowed to really announce it yet because yeah. It's going to be the premiere, I think it's going to be the premiere episode of this new channel. Oh, excellent. And so so they're going to promote it, obviously, but I, I, I don't think they've fully kind of opened yet, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it will be out. And then once once it's played on Alter for a while and this new channel, I'm going to seek out other venues, obviously, like Amazon and yeah. maybe Seed and Spark and... Um, short of the week, like different places where it can live, but I kind of want to um, give Alter the the views right now because I think they they have a great subscription size, they, like amount of people that watch stuff, and I would love to get fans' eyes on it. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. So what's uh, what's in the future? I know you've recently had a screenplay, and so was it Nightmare Film Festival Eden? What yeah. else are you working on? Um. So I wrote Eden just for nightmares essentially it's a short and um i submitted it to nightmares it also got into oregon scream week and um it was a semi-finalist at vancouver horror show but i and I, I would like to make it it's much much shorter and more simple than the my other two projects but it would be a really great third like if i made a trilogy or an anthology of jackson boo this would be a great third kind of a piece um so I'm hoping to make that, and I'm also writing a feature. Oh, I've been writing it for two years, and I don't know if it'll ever be done. I hope, I hope so. Um, it's called New Mom. Um, it's also horror, horror thriller. Um, and I'm also possibly, there's been some interest in a boo feature, so I'm oh, nice. kind of brainstorming what that might look like. Um, But at the moment, I'm honestly very discouraged that I'm having a hard time writing a feature at all. (laughs) Like, I've never actually finished a feature. Um, And I find short to be so much easier to write, not just because of length, just because of structure. Mm. Um, I just can, I can understand the story better. I don't have to explain everything. I don't have to go in deep, anywhere you know what I mean you just get in and get out um and I really like that about short films 
but you can't make a career off of short films. <laughs> so here I am trying to write a couple of features. That's what's next. And um, also my friend Jeremy Herbert, who's a award-winning screenwriter, wrote a short for me to direct that I asked him to do um, to possibly direct and star in. And so hopefully we can make that. I just think we're going to need a little bit of money and I just don't know if I can get into all that right now. <laughs> like if I can find a producer who wants to crowdfund or get us, you know, a few thousand dollars so we can make it, then I would love that. But I don't know if I can like take all that on right now on top of everything else that's happening and I'm working and et cetera. Well, fingers crossed that that does work out. Obviously, one of the things that, like, because you've had two pretty damn successful short films, and it's taken you longer to get those scripts right and to get everything right, it's benefited. So I'm hoping the same will happen with the screenplay. Thank you. Yeah, that's the idea. I, look, I can probably write a shitty screenplay quicker. <laughs> but I, I just, I'm, I'm very hard on myself, and I'm a perfectionist, and... Like, Eden, I wrote really quickly because it was it was a very simple idea and it's six pages and, like, you know, how much how much could you say? Um, but I could even probably expand on that if I had had more time. But Jackson Boo took a long time because I really didn't... I wanted to write a smart screenplay and I think that, honestly, the success of the films lies a lot in, in the writing because... Um, you can have beautiful cinematography and great acting and whatever, but if the script is bad, it just, it ruins it. It's the story. Mm. It's the, like, I feel like it's one of the most important parts. Um, and so I feel like you can kind of skimp on a lot of other things, but if that script is not solid, um, it's just not going to be as well received, you know? I mean, I've seen some movies that are beautiful. I mean, beautiful. Like, the cinematography is, like, way better than anything I've ever achieved. But it looks like a music video, almost, because mm. there's no there's no substance to the story. It's just supposed to look pretty. No, I, I totally agree with you. Sometimes story gets completely lost to people. Actually, leads me to my last question. Um, I always ask this, this question to people. Let's pretend budgets aren't a consideration. What would be that dream story you'd want to tell on film? Oh, God. <laughs> um, well, actually, I have another feature I'm working on that it would need a, an instance where, like, budget is not a <laughs> budget is not a concern. Um, it's actually about a teenage sex addict um, okay. who tries to kill herself, and <laughs> she tells most of the story from, like, a purgatory-type place. Oh. Um and there's like all these doors and she has to kind of revisit different parts of her life to kind of figure out how she got there and why um because she doesn't really remember um and it has a lot of locations a lot of cast a lot of special effects um and it's also a very uh it's kind of a risky story to tell <laughs> i mean she's a you know teenage or, or 20 something and probably going to make her 20 something um, year old sex addict so of course there's going to be a lot of scenes that are maybe rough to watch or whatever so I don't know I think that would probably be that's like my dream dream project that I, I work on a little bit here and there but I know that I couldn't really ever make it anytime soon so I've been trying to focus on the things that I could actually afford to do <laughs> No, that's completely understandable. But I have no, I have no dreams to have like a big action movie or anything like <laughs> that. Like I don't need, I don't need all the blowing up or fancy monster effects or anything like that yet. <laughs> I really like that idea. It sounds kind of fascinating. And if you ever do write it, it'd be very interesting to read. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I have a, I have a like a sixty-page version of it. It's just kind of all over the place. But uh, when I get it a little more together, I'd be happy to share it. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It's been lovely chatting to you, and uh, yeah, we'll try and put we'll put some link to any of um, any of your films and stuff down below on the screen. And um, yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank for you joining so us. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. More than welcome. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. So thanks for that interview, Sam. It's really cool. So. 
we decided that we wanted to discuss our favorite horror films um, this week, but also within that, what we really want to kind of open up in terms of a discussion is what makes a horror film unique or what makes it dynamic enough and scares people, what makes it a horror film, a good horror film. Um, so I'll probably kick this off by saying, for me personally, my favorite horror film, like the one that stands out the most is probably The Woman in Black. And the reason for that is that I think, with what for me personally, what makes a good horror film is that anticipation, that intensity, that kind of, you're waiting for something to happen, but it doesn't happen, and then then something does happen. And the, the way that they do the jump scares is just very off kilter than the normal sort of tropes. If you think of like 80s horrors and stuff, like the music cues with the, the jump scare, um, whereas in The Woman in Black, a particular scene um, that stands out is whenever you, you have that POV of her looking at um, the Daniel Radcliffe's character. And um, <clears throat> so it's a POV. And you as she starts to move and the camera goes, you see her just in the, the, the top left-hand corner in the mirror, like a reflection. And it's so subtle. But you're like, oh my God. And you get goosebumps. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> Shit's about to kick off! <laughs> With that sort of um, jump scare thing, like there's uh, uh, Ty West is, uh, I, I love um, The Innkeepers and uh, House of the Devil um, for that very thing that they, he used the jump scares to like uh, almost subverting them so that, so that you expected uh, something to happen and you build all the intensity to it and it just a broom falls out of a cupboard or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. And it really sort of like plays with that jump scare, building that in t uh, intensity and, uh, and then not delivering on it so that in the end when it does deliver on it, it's much more powerful. It sort of desensitizes you to the whole um, jump scare technique. Exactly. And I think even using them sort of traits, whenever there's scenes where like there might not necessarily be any music, so there's no atmosphere. Again, if I go back to Women in Black, there's just uh, a particular scene where he starts to investigate the um, the graveyard and it's just a side pan and he's walking across the shot and it's kind of going along with him and she's in the background. But there's no music or anything really to it and you're like, whoa, whoa, oh God, she's there. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, and that then kind of gets you more anticipated for the moments wherever it does build that intensity. Because good horror has always used uh, jump scares. It's just obviously recently there's been a bit more of an indulgence in jump scares. Because it creates that immediate reaction. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, with what Ty West done and what Woman in Black did well was... <clears throat> it would unnerve you. So mm. you knew something was coming or you'd see it, but you weren't... You're drawn in by the characters. You're not always going to pay attention to the background. Yeah. And I always think that's interesting to do. It's, um, it's a weird way because it doesn't always build towards the immediate jump scare you expect. And I always think of um, Alien where he's trying to get the cat's attention and there's no music, but you can see this, the, the alien slowly coming down behind him and his attention is completely there. <clears throat> and I think that's one of the things that makes it really work is that his attention is on something in forward. You're like, no, what about a thing backwards behind you? Yeah. And you're like, all right, it's going to eat in many it's seconds. Kinda, it's sort of panto-ish, isn't it? It is, but what... Yeah, you what go, <laughs> it's behind you! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just the interesting thing is it doesn't give you that payoff. So you're sort of stuck with that moment of going, okay, it's going to come at some point then. And then when it usually does, that's when the jump scare is most effective. Because that's when it's like, here it is, and you didn't expect it to come at that moment. Yeah. I think in terms of Alien and other horror films that have done that quite effectively, you're, like the character's focus is on something else, and there's something in the background that's going on, and you can see that it's getting closer. Yeah. Imminent doom. You as a, an audience member watching it, you feel like you're a part of the cast, and you're like... Like, look behind you, fucking hell, it's going to get you. And you, you sort of live on that anticipation. Like, no, get out of there. But it's always going to end the way that you don't want it to. So then you're like, oh, God, and it impacts you even more because you felt like you could help them, but you couldn't help them mm. yeah. in reality. Yeah, it sort of uses uh, that, that distance between you and the, the, the sort of, the, the actual narrative uh, it's a unlike wall, a sort of theatre or anything like that you know it, it, there's no way for an audience to um, inter, interject in any way yeah I agree but it allows you to have more of a and we've said it before with horror it allows you to really hold on to that empathy towards the character because you don't you don't want them to get hurt even though you know you're watching a film where they're going to get hurt 
It's why slashes do it so well. Yeah. Mm. And um, if we're continuing our theme of what, what our favourites are and why and all that, Nightmare <laughs> on Elm Street. My, Nightmare on Elm Street is one of my favourite films. It's one of my favourite franchises, but it all starts with the first one with what, what, what Wes Craven did. And I think, because that film does work with jump scares, but it also plays more on that kind of, you have the empathy for the characters because you're seeing them as they're just, they're just teenagers. And then you're seeing the dreams. And the dreams, of course, is such an open interpretation of the subconscious. So you can see all those things that affect them in their lives. And it's twisted and it's hideous with the creation of Freddy. And I think Freddy's one of the most iconic characters ever made in any horror film. Yeah. He's just... I mean, the, the general concept of him, he's, quite, you know, he's a child killer. <laughs> so it's already like you shouldn't have any sort of charismatic aspect to him. But Robert England, he brings it. He brings such a crazy dynamic. And I know it's like a, a load of combination of different performances that he wanted to try out. And yeah, he just, he just brings so much to it. And I think that's what kind of leads me to think of like iconic horror characters. Yeah. It's so important to a good film is how good is your monster. Well, that's the thing is that like with most, if you, if you were to just off the cuff turn around and think of like any famous um, horror film, you straight away know the villain. Like, yeah, you think yeah. of Jason, Friday the 13th. You think of Halloween. you got Mike, uh, Mike Myers. Michael <laughs> Myers. Yeah, different film. Um, yeah, they're iconic. Yeah. They established themselves as a key figure within that role. And that, that's what kind of made the film so successful. Well, it's, it, and it's, uh, it goes right back, doesn't it? When you think of, I know it's in the name, but Dracula. You think yeah. Of, yeah. You know, Frankenstein. That's, they always think of the monster. You never think of the scientist, you think of the monster, right? It's well, just they some... think that Frankenstein is Frankenstein, but it's actually <laughs> Frankenstein's monster, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, mm. yeah. That's it's the iconicness of these monsters. And it doesn't necessarily always mean that the quality of the film's going to be there, but you stay with that iconicness of the character, you know? It made me uh, think about um, Nosferatu before when you were saying that already. So I, I sort of had that Dracula image in my head. The, 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 when you have that sort of charismatic villain character, mm. no matter how evil they are, somehow they they just engage you in such a way that you you like can't you you, you can't take your eyes off them. They're they're I don't know. There's something that's like terrifying and yet yet uh, enjoyable at the same time. Do you think, so like question to both of you, that in terms of horror, whenever you have a villain who wears a mask, so think of Jason, Scream, um, Michael Myers, like does that make it more alluring? Like yeah. more intriguing? When you got Freddy, that kind of, it's just that weird sort of thing, it's how iconic that character's been built up or how he's portrayed than so much wearing a mask. Yeah, I think I think the mask can like the mask works differently because the characters are quite sort of uh, you know they're they're all about the physicality as soon as that that uh, that character's in a mask and that's what Scream kind of like changed to me is because mm. like you know that that wasn't a a powerful person in a mask you know like Michael Myers was or Jason was it was right? a more of like a, who is it yeah like, who yeah. of the like cast is you this were, character you believed that it was an ordinary person yeah yeah uh, all the way through and, and it had sort of like a, a bit of a I don't know it, it, it was like not a big build not sort of like turning suddenly or doing these kind and walking of walking like, slowly like, yeah well the fact that you could hear their voice because they were chatting on the phone and stuff. They were calling. But it wasn't up technically and... their voice, because it's like a. Yeah, but that's what I mean. But even giving the serial killer the voice. Yeah, you think it before the ones in the mask never never really spoke. Like that's the, true. That's very true. Those ones, anyway. I mean, I imagine there's other. <laughs> I think the only problem with masked killers and that kind of thing of having an iconic uh, monster is that sometimes your film could be engulfed by it. And it just becomes about that character. Mm. And if you don't have, like, if it's not a franchise where you're like, all right, I'm cool with that. I've been with this guy for a while. And someone tries to do it immediately or they try to make it the biggest thing. And you miss out on one of the most important things of horror. The victim. The mm. final girl. And all those films we said, like, going to Halloween, Jamie Lee Curtis, that is one of the most like, iconic final girls there is. Yeah. yeah. Sort of set the standard for it, you know? And it's, it's such an important thing for, again, going back to it, empathy, for you to really not want that person to die. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's an odd one because obviously the, the victim, uh, the, the character that you're rooting for has to remain 
likable all the way through and so they tend to echo like the the morality of the society that they that they are, are you know written for or, mm. or you know that that they're, the the film is produced for so like it's it's quite interesting with the victim how they trigger that empathy how they get you to that point of empathy do you find though that like um with films that have the franchise and have gone on for an extended period of time that actually the cast and the victims just become sort of like second best almost and it's more about the iconic like villain pretty much but it's that's down to you know bad scripts it's not always because the people have always got the enthusiasm to make a good sequel it's just sometimes scripts aren't good or they haven't got financing or if, because of the 80s so many things were cut it's a real dodgy line i think it depends what um what kind of horror films you're looking at as well because when you think of um you know those those films of the 80s those franchises of you know freddie and jason and, and michael myers then yeah like the fixation did become on those characters because there were so many films about them but then sort of on the on the flip side of that when you think about like films that follow victims in the sequels um so for mm. example uh, insidious like the second the one and two I, i'm not sure did the third one follow the same people no they, i don't think they, so they kind of follow more the the medium yeah oh yeah it's the yeah, lady yeah. isn't it yeah, um, but in that, like the the villain isn't that iconic, and that meant that they were able to sort of take different villains from that un you know that universe kind of well, idea. It's, it's, I suppose it's more the supernatural, the isn't it? When it comes to like victims um, continuing in films, it does happen quite often. Or you find usually the side character as their own little franchise, and there yeah. are so many, like the franchise of Phantasm. Phantasm, you're following. Um, the main guy and then from the second one and always the second one you're going to follow the main guy because they're like that's what works mm. when we get to the third four fifth six seventh wherever else it's going it's always going to be those characters who you kind of feel got comfortable in the role and they were kind of like this is my career there isn't anything else i'm not trying to expand it beyond horror and there's, there's always that split side where you go some people be like well that means they didn't do anything with their career it's like well no they stuck to their fan base and they knew what kind of works. And I think that's in Phantasm is Reggie. Reggie is consistently in the films. And yeah, the films get worse for it. Because you're like, why are we still following Reggie? <laughs> but, you, you know, you kind of get the mechanisms as to why we're following this same character. Because that was the one. Tremors is a great example as well. Tremors uh, being the worm monsters. First one has Kevin Bacon in it. Obviously, Bacon didn't come back for the other ones. <laughs> and even did the other ones who they slowly over the films, it just becomes one guy. And that's the main focus. And it's like you're handing the franchise over to them, but at the same time, it was always the fans' favourite. Mm. So you're kind of sticking with them. The other side with um, looking at the victim is the kind of Faust and the devil, where they're already bad people. Mm. And they're kind of allowing this horror stuff to come in. Either they've invited it in themselves, or that through their own actions, there's going to be some consequences. And I think that's always an, um, an important thing because it gives you a kind of a balance to look more at what's happening in reality. Yeah, i I think it's I think it's an interesting tool because it, it like by making those characters unlikable in some ways, you kind of sympathise and empathise with the with the main character more. Because you kind of look at the people around them and think like, well, they're a, they're a decent person amongst all of this yeah, kind of, yeah. you know, um, uh, nastiness. Um, but it also allows you to see those characters being killed by, you know, some, you know a, a slasher character or something like that. Or, or you know, just to be, uh, you know, something horrendous happened to them. Um, simply because they they've been an ass in some way, and you think like, yeah, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be a bit of fun to see you suffer, but um, like like, I think that allows that sort of like tension to be built up for that sort of main character who is the true victim, who's the one that we're focusing on. You know, often turns out to be the hero or the heroine um, by the end of the narrative. I think it, like one interesting trait that it's sort of a flip from what you guys are talking about. So I'm thinking of Drag Me to Hell. And just through 
like I suppose in a way it's kind of greed, isn't it? Like she wants that assistant manager's role, mm. um, <clears throat> and she then like basically says to the the weird gypsy lady that you can't have. Well, you're basically going to get your house repossessed, and um, so through her own actions of selfishness, but to try and further her career, she then gets cursed, and uh, like that's really interesting, because as a as, as person, you know, you're you're always trying to better yourself. You're always trying to um, do well. So whenever you kind of see that in terms of film you then sort of empathise massively with the character. Yeah. Because you could almost see yourself doing that. Because she's only trying to make her life just a mm. bit better. Cause yeah. Like, yeah um, and further her career. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the other thing with horror. Morality. Mm. Morals. A lot of horror films like to teach morals. Yeah. They do it in small little ways where it's not too distracting, where it becomes preachy. But morals always lead to some sort of human corruption. And in those particular stories, like curses... Or even a slasher. A slasher has elements of that yeah. completely. It's going, don't do this. That's why Scream plays off it so well. With yeah, the, well, the they, meta they basically have a character yeah. that tells you what the, the tropes are of a horror film. <laughs> well, Jack. I thought you were going to... Uh, you still haven't revealed your favourite horror film. Oh, um, or a favourite of yours. I don't... I, it's so hard to name any favourites because I love like so many. What's the first films, one that comes to mind? Evil Dead is the first is the first thing that comes to mind. But then I I just love that whole franchise. I love the TV show. I just feel like all of it um, together is just uh, is just something amazing. But I think uh, yeah, Evil Dead Two is probably my probably my favourite horror film. Probably. It's, it's almost like it's, it's almost <laughs> like the reboot. Kind of. It's, it's just, it's, it is Evil Dead too, but they sum up the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they because they wanted to make a... Um, they wanted to remake it, didn't they? Oh, no, they, the studio wanted, studio to wanted them to remake it. They wanted to make a sequel, um, and so they uh, they sort of did both. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind watch. of leads us to like, the fun, manic sort of horror, doesn't it? The mm. horror that takes you to a point where you're like, whoa, this has gone to a whole different level of craziness. Yeah, and I, I think that's what I enjoy about it so much is that is that the the way these creatures the, they the, the, and the deadites they take absolute joy in what they're doing. They they are they just seem happy and all, almost yeah, yeah. making a joke out of it. And that 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 to me is so much more terrifying than than something that's taking it very seriously and, and moody. You know, if 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 something's really enjoying your torture, it's it's horrific. See, another example where you get that kind of energy, and I know you're not the biggest fan of these films, but um, Child's Play, as yeah. in Chucky. Because Chucky has his crazy one-liners, and the very fact that a doll's running around massacring people is insane in itself. But there's some real twisted darkness when, when he's doing the, the, like the falsitude with the child, where the child genuinely believes that this is his happy uh, doll, and then the doll becomes more and more of who he actually is. And again, it's a film that very much like Evil Dead, it says to you, you know, right, forget about reality. We've got voodoo playing here. We've got serial killers who are now like doing their voodoo soul into the dolls. You've accepted that sort of reality. So the manicness, you can go wherever you want after that. And I think horror really allows that. Yeah. It's, it's very much like the genre trope in that respect of, you know, most genres will go, here's your world. Now let's go where we want. But horror has a very... Like, almost specific direction. It's there to horrify you. Mm. And I think, yeah, fun horror, you just... It's going to go wherever. Like, Brain Dead. Brain Dead's yeah. a great example of just, like, how far can you push gore? Yeah. And how ridiculous can you get? <laughs> yeah. It's so silly, but it's so stunningly made. It's just insane, that film. Yeah, and it's funny how gore is... It, it can be used in horror films to do sort of... Uh, to be over the top and fun and and it can be totally the opposite at the same time. It can be truly realistic and terrifying. Or, in the case of The Shining, um, you know, the, the blood coming down the corridors, that mm. is both ridiculous and over the top and yet not funny Sticks in the you. slightest. It's, it's You're not, like, going, oh, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, in, in Evil Dead, when it's uh, the, the blood is shooting out of the wall at him, there's there's an element of slapstick still sort yeah, of yeah. in there. Um and it's funny how you can just do all of these different kinds of things with that with that uh, with that same technique. 
Well, it's violence, isn't it? It's how we interpret violence and how do we want, do we want people to, if they're seeing blood flowing out the walls, they do start thinking, oh, I, I could see anything at this point. And that's what they want to think, oh, <laughs> you're not sure what you're going to see, yeah. but everything's coming towards you. And then there's the other side of violence, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which again is one of my favourites because it's the only film that the opening sound, I was like, I don't know, maybe I should turn this off. That sound of the, and the ksh, and you're just like, ah, oh, this feels like something I shouldn't be watching. Because <laughs> that's the whole note at the beginning to inform you and make you feel like this shouldn't be watched. Why am I watching this? <laughs> and it's not even that violent. Like most of the violence is off camera. And like the opening bit with the woman going on the hook, you don't see her going into the hook. You don't see like a close up of it piercing through the skin. You just see the, and it cuts to reaction. But in your mind, you're going, oh my God. The place, it, it doesn't, yeah. you kind of um, uh, like uh, envisage it, don't you? Yeah, and that's the thing with all violence, creativity is needed. And it's, is it creative because you want to be real? Is it because you want to leave it in the person's mind or do you want to show everything all at once? See, one of the like films when I was growing up, so probably, I say growing up, it was probably about 15, 16, The Hills Have Eyes. Like that was just creepy. And it, it did play on your imagination mm. quite a lot. And like it's very, if you haven't seen it, it's it's not gory as such. It's just what happens within the context of the film. Are talking the original or the remake? The remake. The one that came out in the noughties. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's interesting because like, you know, with, with, with that sort of trick of gore, of, of you know, not seeing something, but, but seeing it in your mind... Um, that's something that like horror obviously has to do all of the time because it yeah, can't yeah. show everything. But what it does show you is it, it, it goes into the close-up of the victim's face. And that's kind of interesting because obviously on the flip side of you know uh, violence and you know, thinking more action kind of style of violence, um, that would show you the close-up of the person who's just done the violence. <laughs> do you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it's kind like of interesting. Saw. I yeah. suppose so to a degree, but it shows you like the... it shows you what the results are. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very much of the morals game as well, isn't yeah. it? So mm. that's the thing. Most great horror films, or, or the ones that you can go, oh, that's one of my favourites. They're all built on structures that you're familiar with. It's just what the director and the writer and the creative team want to do to pull you in a direction where you go, I didn't see it going that way, and that scared me. That's yeah. what a good horror film needs to do. Yeah, and I think there's a certain aspect to with the gore as well that that. Uh, it's it's got to make you sort of feel like like oh can you imagine if that if yeah. that happened you know cringe worthy like, exactly oh. that, that 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 thought of you know like when the the meat hook is going through the, her back like mm. what does that feel like oh you know you can imagine that you can sort of feel it almost in that yeah. bit of your back when you watch it kind of thing it's uh it's the other like it makes you feel that violence it mm. makes you sort of. Uh, 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 What's the word? <laughs> um, appreciate how how like it would actually feel. Mm. It's interesting that the the other side with that with the violence is obviously the other aspect of every horror film, and that's either the unknown or the menace. And every single device that we've just discussed with what you do with violence, you play on the same side with the menace, right? You want to make that undead thing or supernatural or serial killer or just evil force whatever. It's got to either hit you on an empathy point with the character or it's got to make you feel so uncomfortable you don't want to look at where the direction of where the evil's coming from. And you're playing by the same sort of devices. So to sort of summarise then, guys, individually, what, for you personally, um, makes a good horror film? Um, I think, to me, it's, it, it's about uh, narrative, um, but it's also about how you approach uh, that aspect of, of, of horror. I think that it's about showing something truly nasty that is, is terrifying to people so that they can kind of overcome it and so that you can feel that sense of... Um, Relief? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, you're watching something that can't actually harm you and so, in a way, you, you manage to overcome it just by watching it. And, and so it sort of desensitizes you to fear in other things. And I think a good horror film uh, like does that. It has that impact on you where, where you feel scared, but by the end of it, you've overcome it. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can overcome other things. 
I think uh, Jack, I do agree with what Jack's saying there, like that, that cathartic kind of experience, you know, using it. And I think it does work for that. And I, I like that aspect, but I also like to know that there's a feeling of, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> there is no coming back from this. And so to, to me personally, a great horror film is about utilizing creativity. It's being as creative as possible to horrify people. And it's up to you to decide what direction you want that to do. And it's, it's having that appreciation of how they've done it in the past and going, okay, how do I craft it in my vision, basically? And um, good horror films, you have to realize as, as twisted and nasty as you want to be, empathy has to be your best friend at the same time. And sometimes empathy can play in a weird sense where you've got nasty character, nasty thing happening, but there's just enough to make him pitfall. So you're still kind of, emph emph there's the empathy there, but you're also like, nah, they, they, they should, it should have happened to them, you know? <laughs> So characters and, and being being real free with creativity, you know, like really just going, how how do how can I display this that scares the shit out of me and then will hopefully have an effect on other people? Because if you're distanced from the fear, unless you're really studying as to why that scares others, you're not really you're not really feeling what a horror film should be in that respect. You need to have some sort of connection with that scares the shit out of me. Hmm. I think for me, um, <clears throat> it has to be intense. It has to live on anticipation. I think whenever I've watched the horror films like in the past and they just throw loads of different jump scares at you, I think they're trying to be creative, but at the same time, I become desensitized to it. I'm just like, ah, oh, right, not really fussed now. Don't really care. And I, I become less engaging. Whereas if I feel like there's so much anticipation and something is going to happen at any given point, and then when something does happen, it's not quite the thing that you thought was going to happen. And then something does happen when you didn't think it was going to happen. Like, it keeps you on the edge of your seat, keeps you anticipating the whole time. And that, that for me, it's like, if you give me a horror film like that, I love you. Innkeepers and uh, The House of the Devil. There you go. Watch them. <laughs> I'll watch them. <laughs> so anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Um, we'll have another one next week. As ever, please leave us a like. Leave a comment. Uh, if there's any kind of horror films that you want to discuss, please leave a comment. And subscribe and check out our website, www.trasharts.co.uk. And Sam, what's the website for the t-shirts and stuff? Uh, it's teesprings.com. And if you look up Trash Arts Limited or LTD. Awesome. Other than that, guys, hope you enjoyed Trash Arts Takeout. Ta-da. <laughs>